Hello everybody. This is the first time I'm trying to do this, so forgive me if I make errors. I have never done a live stream before. Uh, my name is Dr. Robert Groisman. I am an anesthesiologist and pain management physician, and I am dual boarded in each. Um, I'm here to talk about long COVID, about treatments, about what works, what doesn't work, why it works. This is a question from Carlos Cellini. And this is a question about a 10-year-old son. So yes, um, regarding migraine headaches, um, that are, especially if they're caused by long COVID, um, I tend to rely more on electrical stimulation for these. Um, vagus, nerve has, vagus nerve stimulation has helped with migraine headaches as well as um, targeting the trigeminal V1 branch, which is right here on the forehead. There are stimulators that, that can be used for that as well. Both have been shown to help with migraine headaches, uh, specifically if, um, if associated with long COVID. Um, another p possible treatment would be um, TMS or MERT, again. So another question we have from Britta, and this question regards to stellate ganglion blocks and side effects. So, and also the TENS unit. So let's address potential side effects from a stellate ganglion block. And of course, this assumes that the practitioner who's placing the needle and injecting the medication into your neck uh, knows what they're doing. Um, because there, there are many important structures in about a two inch square space. Um, some of them are the uh, internal jugular vein, the carotid artery, um, you have the thyroid gland, the vertebral artery, and uh, the brachial plexus, which are the nerves that are coming out just laterally to where we need to go. That means just to the side. Um, they're coming out of the spinal cord and out into form the brachial plexus. So um, assuming that you can recognize all these and um, not hit any of these, uh, the only side effect that you, you potentially can see aside from an inadvertent allergy to a local anesthetic, for instance, like uh, lidocaine or bupivacaine or ropivacaine, um, would be the Horner syndrome. Uh, that's the main syndrome that we see. The second part is the, the throat part, which is the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Now, that's nothing to do with having a successful stellate ganglion block or not. That has more to do with just inadvertently blocking the recurrent laryngeal nerve that goes to the vocal cords. And this is the reason we don't want to do both sides at the same time, because both vocal cords will close, and that creates a medical emergency, and we don't want to see that. Um, from the Horner syndrome, the things that we, we see and we want to see are uh, either a red eye with the white of the eye that we blocked, um, the sm a smaller pupil on the side that we blocked, the nose will be stuffy but only on one side, and um, you'll see flushing and redness uh, either in the face, the neck, or the arm. Um, if you see three of these, uh, I missed one, uh, the, the lid, the one that people most notice is the upper lid tends to be at half mast. If you notice at least three of these, you have a good stellate ganglion block. If it lasts for you for more than, let's say, 30 minutes, then you know you've had a decent, um, good working stellate ganglion block. That's the, really the only way we can find out if, um, find out if you had a good, st good stellate ganglion block and a sympathectomy, which is what we're after here, on, on the side that was blocked. All right, let me see what, uh, that we have been getting a lot of questions here. What percentage of success are you seeing? That's a question from Shannon. That's kind of a loaded question. It really depends on what symptom we're looking at, because each symptom has different um, levels of success. For instance, anosmia seems to respond really well. Brain fog seems to respond really well. Ne nearly 100%, but not 100. Uh, prosmia is, is lower, uh, roughly between 60 and 70% 70, 70 success. And by success, I mean there's any improvement uh, from where you were before. What, what, what I'm looking for is um, 
any, if you couldn't tolerate a food and now you can, that's a win in my book. Um, even if it, even if it doesn't taste the same or doesn't smell the same, um, really, th that's still a win, uh, and I consider that a success. Um, uh, let me go back to the tens unit. Uh, possible side effects of overstimulating the vagus nerve. Well, some people have reported. Um, getting a headache or trouble sleeping, insomnia, and some, and this is very few and very rare, but it still can happen, some have had uh, gastrointestinal upset, either um, abdominal pain, things like that. So uh, Kyle asked, how is the success rate for those without smell and taste issues? Um, the stellar ganglion block that um, I've been treating patients for are mainly for four symptoms. Um, the first one being obviously the smell and taste, um, whether it's anosmia, parosmia, or hyposmia, uh, and including the, the taste part as well. Um, and um, brain fog and uh, chronic fatigue. Uh, those are the main symptoms that I've been treating uh, and have been seeing successes with. And you can use it for other reasons as well, but um, those are the main ones that I've seen and treated. A question from Tanya asks why some people with parosmia don't get results from an SGB. It's pretty much like any other medication, surgery, or treatment. Um, I don't know of any intervention that can result in a 100% success rate in every single person. Um, I don't really have a good answer to that, um, except that not every treatment works for every, you know, for every single problem uh, that you're treating it for. Let's see here. Faye asks about other symptoms such as fatigue, hearing loss, aches and pains, hair loss, loss of smell and taste. She has not been able to find much help in, in the UK, which is where she's located. Um, so, I mean, the easy answer is, is the, the external ear vagus nerve stimulation works for many of the symptoms of long COVID, not hair loss. Um, that that's that's likely directly a uh, consequence from being infected with COVID, um, but many of the symptoms that you mention are, are responsive and do respond um, to the vagus nerve stimulation. It's not going to be an immediate fix. You need to do this once a day or twice a day for at least two weeks, if not thirty days. Um, I don't know anybody in particular. Um, in the, in, the, in the United Kingdom who can do the block and I tend to hesitate to recommend somebody unless I've seen them do the block and I know they do it safely and effectively. Uh, Robin asks a question about placement of the TENS unit. Yes, there's, there's many different places to put it but in general what we're after is the vagus afferents with an A, not efferents. Which, are, which is basically, uh, we want the input part. We want to be able to influence the vagus nerve. The efferents, which are also on the ear, uh, is, is the output. And there's one or two other nerves that also are found on the ear. So what we want to do is we want to stimulate the afferent nerves and cause the vagus nerve to fire. Um, the easiest way to explain it is the any part of the ear. Basically, any place on the ear that's inside that's not sticking out is fine, including the tragus. Uh, that's essentially the easiest way to find it. If you have a dual-sided clip where, where it has two contacts, uh, put on the tragus and you're done. Uh, if you don't have that, put one on the tragus or if you could fit both on the any part of the ear, which is called the concha area, um, that will work just fine. Lynn asks, what happens if you did a stellar ganglion block but then had some regression? So uh, in those cases, I look at how far, uh, how far the symptoms uh, were away, I guess, before regression happened. If it's only a few days, you, you can repeat it once, but I wouldn't continue, continually repeat it over and over again. If you've gotten six months, Yes, I would repeat it. Uh, for people who regress very quickly um, after the procedure, I recommend a, a procedure called uh, PRF or uh, pulse radio frequency. 
Uh, that's a non-destructive way to stun uh, nerve tissue so that uh, it goes quiet uh, anywhere from a week to up to six months. Uh, during this time, the nervous system can heal itself and, uh, and get back to where it needs to be. Um, unfortunately, uh, if the parasympathetic tone is low, you don't heal. Um, just don't, um, your system doesn't heal. Let's see. So um, Ivan is asking about uh, is C7 for POTS or C4 and C6? So um, this is a great segue into kind of looking why do we do C4 in the first place? So uh, the stellar ganglion lives at anywhere between C7 and T1, but um, going at C7, there's risk of uh, potentially uh, hitting the top of the lung called the cupola of the lung. Uh, you usually do see it under ultrasound, but most doctors don't want to take a risk and we just go to C6 and let the medication spread downwards or inferiorly. Um, the, second, the second issue with C7 is um, the vertebral artery is often unprotected. It just sits there right in the open and it's a big artery and it goes right to the brain. So um, we do it at C6 for, for, for several uh, safety reasons. Um, one, one particular area is not for any condition. The goal here is to do a sympathectomy or a sympathetic block, uh, whether it's done at C6 or C7 or even at T1, uh, the goal is the same, is to basically do a sympathectomy. C4 is added because that's, the, that's part of the cervical, superior cervical chain. It's, it's part of the, I guess, train tracks that communicate from the stale ganglion all the way up to the brain. So we're, we're hitting it at two points, and we found that, have, uh, that, that results in um, higher success rates. Uh, I'm being asked about the Wim Hof method. The guy is a healthy guy. He's, um, he obviously um, wants to condition his body, which is great. Uh, I know guys that do this in the Polar Bear Club in, in New York. Um, they come out in the middle of winter, and they take a dip. Um, Breath work is great too. Uh, it helps improve the parasympathetic nervous system. However, um, you got to keep two things in mind. The first is, is what are you exactly doing with the Wim Hof method? Well, at least in my mind, you are conditioning your body um, for stress. Uh, but really, the only, the only effect it has is on the immune system and how it responds. Um, not necessarily your autonomic nervous system. So um, the cold work that Wim Hof describes, at least with cold showers and things like that, really don't do a whole lot for uh, improving your even parasympathetic nervous system tone. Uh, you would need to be in a much colder environment and even in that cold environment, uh, the effects kind of um, decrease over five days where after five days it will make a difference if you're cold or not your parasympathetic drive won't be any higher. Uh, Michelle is asking about um, comparing notes essentially uh, between doctors. Uh, you know part of the problem is is um, I, I don't see how these are done and um, I don't know how somebody else is doing it where the needle position is. Every single patient is unique um, the stellar ganglion is going to be slightly in a different spot. Um, there's differences in uh, the anterior tubercles. Uh, there's differences in the muscle shapes. So each time you look at it, it, it really is kind of a brand new picture each time. Sometimes you have to think outside the box to know where you're going. Um, as far as uh, the four hour versus Dr. Gaskins, um, uh, Dr. David Gaskins, uh, one hour or 30 minutes, uh, I believe, and I don't want to speak out of turn, and I don't want to speak for David, but um, he believes that the, the crux of the effect of the reset happens in the first few minutes of doing the block. In other words, you do the block and the sympathectomy happens, but it, um, the, the, the recovery part happens in the first, I guess, 30 minutes. Um, but my thinking is, is that um, if I'm putting a needle in somebody's neck, or, or putting two needles in somebody's neck, um, I want to give it the, 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 the longest period of time for it to have an effect. Um, he mentioned at one point 
um, that the onset was 20-30 minutes. Uh, for, for me personally, uh, using ropivacaine, I've seen an um, onset of the block within the first uh, 30 seconds to a minute. Uh, it may be the proximity of um, my needle point to the stel ganglion, I don't know, but I've never seen a delay of 20 to 30 minutes of onset. And uh, while the sympathectomy is there, um, I wanted to do its work, uh, sort of, you know, you can try prying, you know, prying the gas pedal up once or twice, or you can do it 30 times or 50 times or 100 times. Um, by keeping the block effective for four hours or six hours, um, my hope is that it will increase the chances of, of recovery. <laughs> Robin asks, uh, if, is North Dakota cold enough? Um, yeah, I would, I would say that would be, but not for what um, Wim Hof was trying to accomplish, I think, um, or what, what we're trying to accomplish with the autonomic nervous system. Christina asks if cryotherapy treatments uh, would help. Now, cryo treatments uh, do, do go down, uh, the temperature goes down low enough to actually affect the parasympathetic nervous system. However, as I said, when they've, when they've tried these kind of treatments, uh, after five times, after five different um, attempts, uh, basically daily attempts, five days in a row, <clears throat> they found that uh, the effect on the parasympathetic nervous system was uh, very attenuated and basically not doing anything. Um, the, other, the other issue is, is it can also activate the sympathetic nervous system, which we don't really want to do because it's already uh, fairly high, the tone is high, and uh, we're already in you know, fight or flight mode to begin with. So um, you know, just going back to strengthening your body, um, it's already weakened from, from the infection, from, from the sympathetic tone being very high. So uh, trying to condition in this kind of state could sometimes lead to unintended consequences. Uh, Lori is asking if I think that this is sinus related or inflammation or of the olfactory. So let me, let me first put out there that uh, I don't think there's any ongoing olfactory bulb, olfactory nerve uh, damage. Um, if there were, the recovery wouldn't happen within, you know, within five minutes of a stellar ganglion block or within a few days of um, vagus nerve stimulation. Um, there may have been initial damage from the initial infection, but this kind of stuff heals up within a few days to at least a week or two afterwards. Um, do I think this is sinus-related in or, or inflammation? I don't. The reason is is because uh, there's been multiple people who have gotten uh, CAT scans of the face and of the sinuses, and their sinuses look perfectly normal. In fact, everything looks normal. Um, EEGs look normal. Their, um, their MRIs of the brain look normal. Um, but the blood works looks normal. Everything looks normal, which is what makes long COVID so puzzling. Carrie is asking about um, what I think about hyposmia. So I really think of all these conditions with, um, with olfactory dysfunction, as we call them, um, on a curve or on a bell-shaped curve. Uh, on one end is anosmia, on the other end is normal, I guess, normal taste and smell. Um, anywhere in between would be hyposmia and parosmia. I know we refer to them as separate entities, but they're all kind of on the same curve. Um, she's also asking what, why does her smell and taste come in and out? Um, basically some, some days are good, some days are bad. I believe this is to be related to the unstable nature of the autonomic nervous system. Different stressors can push you over the limit again. Normally your body would be able to compensate, but um, in, in an in an unstable configuration that long, that long COVID uh, puts it in, there's basically an imbalance. Um, and if you push, if you push um, the sympathetic nervous system with stress, it will get worse. If you relax and and, and calm down, it will get better. This this also tells me that uh, your system is no longer stuck, which is great. Um, that's kind of the best place to be at uh, because you, you typically don't need to do a stellar ganglion block at that point. You can just coax uh, your parasympathetic nervous system um, by, using, um, um, by using the vagus nerve stimulator. Let's see here. So Shannon 
Right, hang on one second. Let me fix my camera here. Shannon asks um, about HRV and um, I guess what what the different numbers mean. Let's talk about HRV in, in general. It's a heart rate variability. So what we're looking at is microsecond differences or millisecond differences, I should say, between beats. And we don't want to focus on a small section. We want to get a trend. Where do people normally live? We know that HRV declines with age, but but in general, um, we want we want to be above 50. Low. So the lower the number, the more the sympathetic nervous system is in charge, and the higher the number, the parasympathetic num uh, is in charge. I have not looked at um, the post the, the post procedure numbers of HRV because you really don't want to look at one or two days worth. You want to get a feel for where the trend is over weeks. Um, so I, I don't really have a way to track that after HGB. Carlo asks about which device I recommend and uh, that's just um, the 10 7000 unit. Uh, it runs below $40 usually and uh, you're welcome to use any other device as long as you can adjust the pulse width and um, the frequency. Uh, as long as you can do those two things, you're, you're golden. Um, Britta asked about uh, Dr. Gupta's uh, podcast, I guess, uh, regarding uh, using a steroid nasal rinse and smell training. Um, there's really not a whole lot of evidence to support that for anosmia, parosmia, for long COVID specifically. Um, there's, there's really no studies that I've found that have been successful or showing any improvement using those methods, uh, where at the stellar ganglion block there has been. There's actually two studies now. Uh, Deborah is asking, if you know you're going to be in a stressful situation and it's unavoidable, will the SGB work? Yes, it will work, but um, you may regress. Uh, you know, the issue is, is we want to let your nervous system heal. And to do that, you need to have a high parasympathetic tone, which normally, uh, if you don't have long COVID or anything else, uh, you're spending 99.9% .9 of your day with parasympathetic uh, basically controlling controlling your nervous system. It's got the reins, um, and uh, in the point one time that you know you chased by a rabid dog, or almost got hit by a car, or um, you know almost got into a fight, or got into a fight, uh, that's when the that's when the sympathetic system, nervous system steps in, and that's when it's really necessary. Uh, otherwise, we want it to be asleep. We want it to be a we want it to be left alone. Yes, it's still active normally, but the, but parasympathetic is definitely dominant. Um, so if you can't avoid the situation, I mean, this is life, unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, we, we don't control um, you know our circumstances or environment. Um, stressors come along, and uh, hopefully the, the nervous system has a chance to heal. We want to give it a, at least uh, a couple of weeks um, after a stellar ganglion block to, to basically heal. Um, but I know that's asking for too much and we can't, we can't control that. <laughs> uh, Robin is asking about the citrate intranasal spray. I have not heard about it or read anything about it. Uh, I will take a look. I hope I didn't miss anybody's questions. Oh, um, Robin again was asking about the red clip and the black clip. It's one is the anode, one is the cathode. One is positive, one is negative. Um, the charge is produced at the positive end, and it, it basically returns at the negative end. Um, either either one will stimulate uh, the vagus nerve. So I don't want you to worry too much about which one to put on the tragus or uh, the part of the ear, uh, as long as it's within close proximity of each other, because we don't want it. To travel a long distance and therefore the charge decreases. Anna asks about my theory about what causes COVID uh, lo loss of smell. My my theory on this, and this hasn't been proven, is regional blood flow problems. Um, normally uh, the brain is able to control a regional blood flow where blood is directed to as well as uh, basically the senses. Um, and during sympathetic drive, it gets diverted to the frontal lobe in areas where um, danger and running or fighting is important, not not smelling or or or, or tasting. 
and um, that's how I believe this Deleganglion works. Uh, everybody talks about this reset, but what is this reset? Um, this is what I think it is. Uh, you, you're altering the blood flow back to where it was normally. Uh, and that's why the recovery is, uh, is so immediate and, uh, and profound. All right, one more question, and uh, then I'm going to have to sign off. Hyperbaric oxygen. Um, I don't think it can hurt. Carlo, Carlo asks this question. Uh, I don't think it can hurt. It is very expensive if you want to do real hyperbaric oxygen, not the kind of stuff you would see at the med spa. Uh, the reason is, is because um, it's essentially... What, what med spas do is uh, they'll fill up a large bag where you sit into it or lay into it full of oxygen and uh, God forbid there's any spark anywhere. Um, I think it's very, very dangerous. Um, real hyperbaric chambers are not built like this. Um, normally it is uh, very, very expensive to do an actual hyperbaric treatment, hyperbaric oxygen treatment. Um, it kind of looks like a decompression um, room and it is a room it, it it may help to some extent but uh the where it's normally administered is very dangerous and i would not recommend doing it thank you so much um thank you for all the great questions and the comments and um if you guys like this i can do this uh, maybe once a month if i have time i can try to do it uh, twice a month okay thank you very much